Welcome back. Last week, we talked about how uh, God worked through Onesimus's life and how the gospel called Onesimus to change. Uh, we talked about how Onesimus was a runaway who was useless and maybe a thief, but Christianity called him to something entirely different. The week before that, we talked about what Christianity said to our old buddy Philemon, how it called him to view Onesimus not as a piece of property, but as a brother with whom he needed to reconcile. Christianity called him to forgiveness and to grace. I hope you're picking up on the theme here. As we read Philemon, I hope that you are hearing a little bit about what Christianity calls us to. And in this last session, I want us to think about how God used Paul in this story. What role did Paul play? And how does the role that Paul played uh, teach us about the role that we play in people's story and the story of their changes? I wonder, how would this story have been different had it not been for Paul? Um, I believe that Paul uh, was used by God as a catalyst to fix this relationship between Onesimus and Philemon. I believe that God used Paul uh, to bring these two guys back together in the same way that God used Paul in both of their conversion stories. So uh, today I want us to look at how Paul did what Paul did. I don't know about you, uh, but the first time that I reread Philemon for this study, I read it out loud just like I asked you to do, and it struck me a little how manipulative Paul kind of sounds. I'll pick up in verse 4. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I've derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because of the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Uh, when I hear that, I mean, it sort of sounds like Paul is laying it on thick. I mean, if you walked into my office and said, Matthew, every time I think about you, I'm just so grateful and God is doing amazing things through you and you are so awesome. And of all of the preachers, I know you are the best looking and your beard is the best. At some point, at some point, I'm going to stop and say, what do they want? I mean, are you about to sell me a used car or something? And so there's a little bit of that vibe going on here in Philemon. I think it's almost like Paul knows that he's about to ask a lot, so he has to make this abundantly clear. He needs to make sure that Philemon hears that Paul loves him and values him because he's about to challenge him. And I don't know about you, but when someone comes into my life and challenges me, my immediate reaction is not to receive that correction with joy and happiness. My immediate reaction is, shoot the messenger. So I don't think Paul is laying it on thick to be a manipulative weirdo. I think Paul is trying to do something. Paul needs to make sure that his love and his intentions are clear and unmistakable. Paul knows that correction pops the balloon of our pride. And so he has to build up his brother before he asks a hard thing. It pops the balloon of the idea that we're totally self-sufficient. So I have three questions I want you to start with in this session. One, when was a time that someone corrected you and you were able to hear it? I know that's kind of a personal question, but I'm hoping you'll share a story. When was a time that somebody uh, called you out and you were able to hear it? Uh, number two, when was the time that someone called you out and you couldn't hear it? Uh, now, here's the real kicker. Can you see that in hindsight that they were right, but something kept you from being able to hear it? I'm really curious as you tell that story, is it going to have something to do with you or what that person said or how they said it? I imagine there's a lot of different stories. And number three, what made the difference between number one and number two? So I want you to tell those stories, pause the video, come back after you've shared a few of those. As you told those stories, I bet you realized that the timing and the tone of correction make a huge difference. Uh, the way that we say things, the timing of how we say them, the way we say them matters so much. I have always loved Proverbs 27, 14. This is a Bible verse that Glenn Buffington and I can share together and really enjoy. Uh, Proverbs says, if you bless your friend in the morning with a loud voice, it won't sound different than a curse. So remember, if you want to tell me that you love me, don't do it at five in the morning. 
It goes along with my deep-seated belief that if you interrupt a Sunday afternoon nap, someone better be dying. If they're dead, it's too late for me to do anything about it. But if they're dying, I can help, okay? Uh, there are times that are just so important to make sure we say and do the right things. Paul wants to make sure that Philemon hears his love and not just his correction. Now, again, uh, it sounds in some ways like Paul could be a little bit manipulative here. And maybe that's because you have had some people in your life who have tried to manipulate you. But remember that the line between manipulation and coaching is thinner than you might like it to be. And a lot of it has to do with the intent of the person and the relationship that you share with that person. Again, Proverbs 27, verse 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Or Psalm uh, 141, verse 5, Let a righteous man strike me, it's kindness. Let him rebuke me, it's oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. We're foolish if we ignore correction, but we're pretty foolish pretty often. So I want you again to pay attention to Paul's strategy in these verses. We've already talked about how Paul helped Philemon to see Onesimus as a brother, not just as property. I want you to see what else you notice. Verse 8. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what's required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. That part is almost funny to read out loud. Uh, do you hear kind of how he describes it? Again, I, I, I'm not trying to beat up on car salesmen. Marshall, I'm really not talking about you here, okay? You're one of the good ones. But when Paul talks, you know, you hear him say, I'm an old man and I'm a prisoner. He is, in some sense, kind of uh, downplaying his authority. He's, he's trying to say, I'm not coming in here with a rod telling you, you better do this or else. He's playing like he's a grandfather. And isn't he? You know, there's some things that James Hinkle can say to you and to me that I can't say to you and to me because of his years of respect and his years of wisdom. And I know that when he speaks, even if he's wrong, he speaks with my best interest in heart, with the best interest of the kingdom in heart. I love that about James. When I was interning uh, to study to do ministry, there was a preacher who told me how important it was to hug people and love people. I'm not sure how that looks in a COVID-19 world, but that was the advice he gave. And right after he got done telling me that no matter, no matter what you have to say, if people know that you love them and truly believe that, you can say pretty much whatever you need to say. Uh, an older lady walked up and gave him a hug and said, you know, I think Brother Bill could hit us with a two by four, but we know that he loves us so much, we just take it. Now again, I can hear how somebody would abuse that principle, but I hope you hear what I'm trying to say. Why in the world is Paul playing up this? I could command you, but I'm not going to. I'm just an old man. I'm a prisoner. I'm a father figure to you. Why isn't Paul just telling Philemon what to do? I want you to stop, pause the video, and chew on that question. Why is Paul conveying things this way? When you get done, come back and we'll talk a little bit more. Well, Paul certainly had authority. I mean, after all, he was an apostle. He was a man of learning and background and credentials. I mean, he had all sorts of reasons that Paul could walk into a room and tell people what to do and where uh, they should do what they needed to do. Paul had authority, and he had relational authority too. He didn't just have positional authority as an apostle. He had relational authority. He was connected to both Philemon and to Onesimus. It, it looks to me when I read the text that Paul played a hand in both conversion stories. So Paul didn't just have his position as apostle. He had his relationship with Philemon. He had his relationship with Onesimus. But Paul didn't bank on that. He banked on a request. Paul could have been on the council of advisors for both of these guys, but instead of using that authority, he comes with a different angle. I think, my opinion, is that Paul knew that if he nudged them to do the right thing, they would do it. And if they did it that way, 
it would be more fruitful to their development and faith than an outright command. If he forced them or just outright guilted them and said, you better do this or else, I suspect Philemon still would have done the right thing. But I suspect he would have done the right thing grudgingly. How many times in your life have you had the experience where you were going to do something and then someone told you to do it and then you didn't want to do it anymore? I I think Paul knows that little element of, of the human psyche. I think Paul knew that if he nudged them and they thought through what they needed to do and why they needed to do it, it would stick because it wouldn't be his idea anymore. It would be their idea and they would be better prepared in the future to make the right decisions. It's kind of a teach a man to fish sort of thing instead of a give him a fish sort of thing. Have you ever noticed how often the Bible prescribes this sort of leadership? Uh, For certain, there are outright commands. And for sure, I mean, John the Baptist is yelling, repent, you brood of vipers. So, I mean, that that's on the table. Jesus turned over tables too, I suppose. But Christian leaders are called to be very careful in how they exercise authority. For example, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3, shepherds are told not to be domineering over those in the flock, but instead be examples to it. Uh, the King James and several other translations don't use the word domineering. It says, don't lord over your people. Do elders have authority in a church? Well, I think they do. I think they have both positional authority, and if the church is healthy, they have relational authority. And could the elders stand up and say, here is what you must do? I think that's a right that they have. But do I think that's effective? Well, I think Scripture is suggesting that's not generally the most effective. What's more effective is to walk beside someone Matthew 20, verse 25, Jesus uses the same language. He says, Gentiles like to demonstrate their authority by lording over people, but this way is different. Jesus says the path to greatness in his kingdom is not by lording, but by slaving. That's a different sort of way. Effective elders are examples. Effective fathers are examples. Effective mothers are examples. Effective teachers are examples. Effective grocery store clerks are examples. Effective truck drivers are examples of doing the right thing. I can bully you. I can coerce you. I can threaten you. I can guilt you. But if I show you the beauty of the Christian way, it sticks. And if I can help you make the decision of doing the right thing, When I'm no longer there, you might just keep doing the right thing. Whereas if I force you to do the right thing, you'll probably only do the right thing in front of me. And the funny thing about Christianity is it's not interested just in outward behavior. It's interested in the heart. So when Paul speaks in this kind of gentle, kind of nudgy sort of way, he's giving space for them to develop the heart of the matter. He's letting them think through it so they get to the right place. Paul is teaching them to fish. Paul could have said, Philemon, Onesimus, you do right or else. There will be consequences. I think that would have been a legitimate option for him. But what would the consequences have been? Well, how do you feel after you're scolded, even if that person is correct? I don't know about you, but I feel shame and anger and embarrassment I feel a tendency to try to slide out from under the accusation, even if it's true. I I try to lash out. That's what my heart wants to do. Okay, maybe this is too much confession, but I bet you do the same thing because we're made out of the same sort of stuff. I don't know very many people that like correction, but correction, Proverbs says, is incredibly useful. A direct command could have been effective. It would have presumed that Philemon would not do the right thing were it not for Paul's involvement. But Paul believed that Philemon was a Christian. He just needed a little bit of nudging. What if we had that sort of confidence in our kids? You know, that they're going to do the right thing, that they just need a little bit of nudging. What if we had that sort of confidence in the people in the church, that they'll do the right thing, but they just sometimes need a little reminder uh, or a little little nudge in the right direction? What a gospel-like thing to assume that our brothers and sisters in Christ will do the right thing. I have to admit, um, one of the types of feedbacks that I am worst at dealing with is when someone speaks in a way that assumes I'm either going to do wrong or that I'm incompetent, when, when they treat me like I'm an idiot. Paul didn't do that here. He spoke, he said, I could command you, I don't need to do that. What's the old saying, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar? 
Proverbs 15 says that a soft answer turns away wrath, a harsh word stirs up anger. Paul was trying to stir up grace, not anger. These kind words aren't just flattery. It's not manipulation. It's coaching. It's nudging. It's encouragement. I love verse 21. Paul meant what he said. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Now, I could I could hear that pretty cynically, like he, he's really just laying it on thick here, but I think that Paul's telling the truth. I think Paul said, hey, I know you're going to do the right thing. In fact, I know you're going to do more than what's right. I I know that there's right and there's wrong. You're not going to do what's wrong. You're going to do what's right. In fact, you're going to go the extra mile. Hey, who came up with that second mile thing? Yeah, that's a Jesus thing. Paul is encouraging Philemon and Onesimus to think through things as Christians because he believes that they're going to. Do you believe that the other people in the church want to do the right thing? I don't know about you, but I'm not a terribly trusting person by nature. Somebody said when you learn to ride a motorcycle, the first thing you do is learn that everyone on the road is a maniac who wants to kill you. And so you learn not to trust other vehicles because as soon as you do, you get yourself in trouble. And a lot of times life has taught us similar lessons that if I trust other people, that gives them an opportunity to hurt me. And so the lesson that we inadvertently learn is don't let anyone close Never be vulnerable. Don't trust anyone. And I get why we learn those lessons. Man, I have been burned just like you have. But the gospel calls me not to live, oh, what's that line I love so much? Not with a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. So what if I make room in my life for the Pauls to speak? And what if I take the opportunity from time to time to speak? like a Paul, to encourage someone down the right path, to trust that they'll do the right thing. He really believed Philemon and Onesimus would do what's right. Most of us look at faith as an individual thing. You do you, I do me, now stay off my lawn, don't bother me. This is a between me and God. And I'm afraid that some of our Western culture, that's not really a Bible thing. Because when I read scripture, I notice that everyone in everywhere is connected. We've talked about how uh, the church is the body of Christ and the the eye bones connected to the hip bone, okay? Uh, We've talked about how each one of us leans on each other. No man is an island. I love all of those ideas. The story of Philemon reminds me and demonstrates to me that other people affect my faith journey and I affect other people's faith journey. Were it not for Paul, Perhaps neither Philemon nor Onesimus would have been Christians. And were it not for Paul's involvement yet again, the two of them might not have ever reconciled. So my next question is, who has played the part of Paul in your life? I want you to go back into your memory bank, and I want you to think of a time when someone nudged you, when someone wrote you your Philemon letter, when someone corrected you, I've asked that question once before, but I want this time you to think about the person who did it. Maybe not a correction this time, but someone who contributed to your journey. You see, we've started to believe this idea that since faith is my faith and it's personal, it has nothing to do with anyone else. But in this story, Paul, well, Paul meddled, and he meddled in a good way. So again, I want you to, to find another story of a time someone meddled in your life And then, after you've thought about it in your life, I want you to see if anywhere in the Bible you can find a story where someone meddled in someone else's life. I bet you can find it. And I want you to look for the story where they meddled in a positive way, a gospel way, not the other kind of way. How did they do it? Why did it work? And what could have gone wrong? Those are your questions. Come back in just a minute. A few weeks ago on Sunday morning, I shared a message with you called My Council of Advisors. I'm just going to pause right now and imagine that you're all nodding your heads like you actually remember that lesson. Okay, that made me feel a whole lot better. That's what's fun about this video thing. I can just pretend like you didn't have blank looks on your faces just then. 
That was the lesson where I showed a bunch of pictures of some of the people who made differences to my life. They were from different seasons. They were from different beliefs. Some of them I haven't even met. I've just interacted with their writing. Some of them are living. Some of them are dead. But it was helpful to me to think about the people who had touched my life. Do you hear how that idea connects with this idea? In the story of Philemon, Paul sat on those two council of advisors, on Philemon's and on Onesimus's. And he chose to intervene in their lives. He chose to meddle in a positive way. It would have been far easier for Paul to sit back and not get involved. In fact, if you wanted to, you could quote scripture at him to tell him that that was a good idea. Proverbs 26, 17, whoever meddles in a quarrel not his own is like someone who takes a passing dog by the ears. Paul, what's this got to do with you? This is between Philemon and Onesimus and the government, so stay out of it and mind your own business. There's another one. Paul himself said in 1 Thessalonians 4.11 that he wanted us to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands. Don't get involved in other people's junk. That's good advice. But in this case, Paul did get involved. And the Holy Spirit saw fit to give us record of that in this little New Testament letter. So my question is, why? Why this time? Why this way? And how do we need to get involved As we close our study of Philemon, I want to ask you these questions, basically. I want you to think about how Christianity called Philemon to a different way of life. Uh, We talked about that already. And I want you to think about how Christianity called Onesimus to a different way of life. We've talked about that already. But in this week's reading, we've talked about how Christianity called Paul to a different way of life. No, this wasn't his quarrel, but it was his opportunity to help his brothers be the best version of them they could be. I like to believe that Matthew can be the best he can be by himself. I've told you before that I've been going to this spin class at the Y. I hate spin class, and I really hope that since this is on Facebook that the sweet lady who teaches it never finds this video, but Sarah, I hate spin class. I hate it with a burning passion. Here's why I go, because I cannot sit down on a stationary bicycle for 45 minutes and ride it. I can ride a bicycle for hours, but if you put me on a stationary bicycle for 45 minutes and tell me to ride, here's what's going to happen. About three minutes in, I'm going to start praying for the sweet release of death. And about seven minutes in, I'm going to think about all of the other things that I could be doing. And at about 11 minutes in, I'm going to think about all the things that really need to be done. And interspersed between us, I'm going to think of all of the things that hurt and all of the ways I might actually be dying. And eventually, my willpower is going to run out and I'm going to quit. How do I know that? Because that's what's happened every single time I've ever sat on a stationary bicycle. But here's the funny thing. When I walk into that classroom with a dozen other people and it starts and it ends 45 minutes later, maybe this is pride or male ego or something dumb like this. But once I start, I'm not going to be the guy who walks out before it's over. I'm going to finish. Other people help me do what I find difficult to do by myself. Can I confess to you that my ministry makes it easier for me to be a Christian, I think, than me not being in ministry? Well, why? Well, some of it is the pressure of knowing that you're going to ask me questions or the pressure of knowing that I need to stand up in front of you every week and have something to say. Some of it comes from the fact that I know people know what I do, and so it's just a little bit more to take it seriously. And I know that all of those things could go to dark places quickly and lead to hypocrisy and play acting and all that sort of stuff. But I'm going to tell you, that you make it easier for me to be a Christian. Sometimes I want to think, wouldn't it be easier if it was just me and God in a cave and I didn't have to deal with other people? Have you ever thought that? Have you ever felt that? I know a lot of people do. But what I'm suggesting to you through Paul's letter to Philemon is that that is a fantasy and it's not true. We do better together than we ever do apart. Whether it's on a stationary bike or it's in studying of scripture or it's learning how to deal with difficult people. In grade school, I always hated group work, didn't you? Because there was that one person in the group who talked too much, and there was that other person in the group who didn't carry their weight, and then there was that other person whose ideas were always really dumb, and of course, you were the only one who had any sense, and everyone else in the group was thinking one of those three things about you. But here's the thing. Life is nothing but group work. We say it takes a village to raise a child, I didn't have any clue how true that was. 
I'm a better parent because of the good parents that surround me and the good grandparents and great grandparents that surround me. And that's not just because uh, somebody says, hey, Matthew, here's the thing you're doing wrong. Sometimes it's just because I watch and I observe and I see and I think. And some of those lessons are negative. Man, I don't want my kids to turn out like that. Some of those lessons are positive. I sure wish my kids would turn out like. And some of them are our spoken lessons. But Paul's story with Philemon and Onesimus demonstrates that having people who intervene in our lives and intervening in other people's life is vital to Christianity. During this corona stuff, we've been able to do a fairly decent job of connecting you to teaching online. Uh, I've taken a lot of online classes, and I'll tell you that a lot of the online classes I've taken have been just as good, if not better, at communicating content to me than on-the-ground classes. Uh, You know, if I have a question, I can hit pause and I can replay it. If I need to use the bathroom, I can hit pause and come back. If my brain just sort of dies, you know, there's so many options. That's great. But what the classroom always misses, uh, when you do it online at least, is the experience of connecting with other people. I'm really afraid that for years the church has sort of missed out on that. We need to be in each other's homes. We need to be in each other's lives. And not just when I have just finished cleaning the house and when the kids are happy and perfect. You need to see when you can't see my kitchen sink because we haven't done the dishes in three days because that's what your house looks like when somebody isn't coming over. You need to see when Leslie is annoyed at me for being full of myself. You need to see when I'm ready to sell one of the kids on eBay, but I'm afraid they'd return them. We need to be in each other's lives in the careful, uh, conscientious, and gospel way that Paul was in Philemon's and Onesimus. This isn't nosiness. This isn't busybodiness. This isn't prying. This isn't any of that weird stuff. It's caring. It's ooh, ooh. It's loving God and loving neighbor. I'm not going to close by giving you instruction because I'm going to try to put this lesson into practice. I'm going to try to trust you to do the right thing. And I'm going to try to trust you to come up with some right answers here And because, frankly, I don't have all the right answers, and your input here is just as valuable as mine. But as we close, I want your group to study basically two more questions. Number one, when should we get involved in other people's lives? How do you know? What circumstances? When shouldn't we? When do we need to be involved in each other's lives that we're not? Number two, how do we do that? Because I am really convinced that if we put this lesson into practice— The Bible talks so much about confession, and I know so much good about vulnerability and accountability. In fact, all of these words are basically words that are in a circle around the Greek word koinonia, uh, fellowship, connectedness, partnership. That's what it is. It's not just about eating fried chicken after church. It's about doing life together. What I'm trying to nudge you towards is looking for opportunities to have real fellowship with each other. The church has always tended to try to put together programs, and those programs are great helps. They can be nice crutches. They can be good on-ramps. But if we're not taking and making opportunities to help each other, no amount of programs will matter because all we'll ever do is stay on the surface and say, how you doing? Fine. How you doing? Fine. Even though we're actually standing in a funeral home when we say those words. I love the example of how God used Paul and how God changed Philemon and changed Onesimus, and I say changed Paul too. I hope that this letter has been helpful to you to see the power of the gospel in practical life. None of the stuff that we have talked about has been big theological words. It's been really practical. What do you do when you have a problem with someone? What do you do when you made a mistake and you did wrong and now you need to own up to it? What do you do when two other people in your life are at odds with each other? How do you help? How do you avoid hurting? Do you hear how practical and how useful this is? And how would our world be different if the church led the way in these areas? I won't say much more, but I will say this. As I've watched the news these last few weeks, there have been so many stories of partisan politics and uh, the increasing uh, polarization of America where the left gets lefter and the right gets righter, okay? And we just yell at each other. We've had more stories in the last couple weeks about uh, racism 
being alive and well, unfortunately, in some important places in our country. And we're not sure what to do about some of these things. What if you and I applied Christianity to these very questions in our lives? How would that change our witness in the world? Okay, when should we get involved? When shouldn't we? How do we do it? How do we do it in a helpful way? That's what I want you to do. And then I want you to close your time together with a prayer for eyes to see and hands to help and a heart that cares. Thank you so much for spending this time with me in Paul's letter to Philemon.